Yeah, it's been, it's been. <laughs> and I'm on vacation the rest of the year, starting Monday. I was gonna make the make the joke about I come back so you leave. It's like, trying to tell me something here? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, I actually get to eat my meals under my own with my feet under my own table for about the next five weeks. Uh huh. Cool. Absolutely. Those are the kinds of things you frame. Find a spot on the wall. Fridge is good. Fridge. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. There you go. That's awesome. Uh -huh. And reaching kids in a way that makes it so uh, makes an association yeah that's awesome i love that you got your phone off i do hi ashley okay hi ashley <laughs> spotlight on her <laughs> Well, good morning, everyone. The blessing continues. I get to come home for about five weeks. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yes. Until about the uh, sec last two weeks of January, and then I... Tell Gail if she needs to get away, I see some designated you got You got a spare bedroom in case you can't put up with me that long, huh? question is whether or not it, uh, it goes for you. That would be fun, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you can sleep out there in the cactus patch. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started. See if we can pick up where I left off last time I was here. Heavenly Father, It's good coming to your house to share this time with fellow believers, the, the community, the camaraderie, the love, the opportunity to, to share lives with, with these dear people that you bought with your blood. Thank you for that. As we uh, jump back into Second Peter, <clears throat> guide my words. Help me to be accurate. Help me to communicate well. I pray that you would uh, you would just bless these words as they go forth in Jesus' name. Amen. So in order to try and pick this up, I got a little a little wordy on my uh, on my review. Because it's been so broken up for you guys. Peter is addressing the Jewish believers of the dispersion and telling these believers that you have an equal privileged faith that with that of the apostles. However, 
He prays that they would have a binding together with the Lord multiplied so that they would be drawn closer and closer to him. And he says the way to do that is through a full knowledge of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The only way to do that is through the intense mental study of the Word of God. Through that study of the scriptures, you develop these Christian graces which grow and build upon one another until eventually you reach the pinnacle of Christian living, which is true agape, a high valuing of God and mankind. If you do this, you will never be unfruitful in that knowledge of Christ. You will also be guaranteed to never stumble out of the Christian walk and will have a a richer reward as you enter into heaven. He says, now I don't want you to be negligent, in rem- I don't want to be negligent in reminding you of these things, although it's almost time for my death, just as the Lord showed me. But I want you to understand that what we've told you about his power and his presence was not told as cunningly devised fables, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty on the mount. However, there is something even greater than our personal testimony, and that is the scriptures themselves. Now, those scriptures were not of any private origin or source because the holy men of God did not write what they wanted to write, but they wrote as they were moved along by the Spirit of God. There were, however, false prophets among the people then, and there will be false teachers among you. They will lead many people away from the truth of God. Their judgment, however, is waiting for them. The sentence has already been pronounced upon people like that. God's judgment is not lingering or slumbering. Just as God judged the angels and cast them into judgment, just as he judged the sinful world in Noah's day and destroyed them with the flood, just as surely as he judged and destroyed the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, he is going to judge these, and their judgment is sure. So we also see that God knows how to deliver the righteous and protect them. But he also knows how to reserve the unrighteous unto judgment in time to come. That will bring us up to where we left off a couple weeks ago. In 2 Peter 2. And we finished verse 9. And I kind of stopped there. Um, I'm going to drop back and read... Um, I'm going to read verse 9 just for some of the context and because it is kind of splitting the sentence. The context of verse 9 is basically that if if God was able to, to save these righteous people, um, Noah and... and he, he condemned city of, of Sodom and Gomorrah, but even with that, he saved righteous Lot out of that. If, um, if he can do that then, verse 9, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptations and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. Verse 10, where we pick up, and especially those who indulge in f- indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires and despise authority. Daring, self-willed, they do not tremble when they revile angelic majesties. Whereas angels who are greater in might and power do not bring a reviling judgment against them before the Lord. And especially, by context, and God especially knows how to reserve unto judgment. Those who indulge, who order their behavior after the flesh, literally, in its corrupt or passionate desires, and despise authority. The word despise has this idea of to think down upon. We might might say look down upon, but there's, it's not so much a haughty look as it is a haughty attitude, a condescending attitude, a despising of them and their position and their authority. 
Um, the the word authority carries the idea of someone who rebels. This this whole thing, this despising authority, carries the idea of someone who rebels against any kind of authority, whether civil government, God, or any other example. They total they exhibit a total disdain for the concept of authority or lordship. Now I did not look this up. I thought about it and I bunny trailed on something else and I completely forgot to look up the context but in some of the Old Testament it wasn't actually the law it was after that God makes a statement that says rebellion is is the sin of witchcraft okay now without getting into that whole breakout of that What I do want to point out is that the first sin was Lucifer rebelling against God and his authority. He said, I will be like that. I don't accept him in that position. I'm just as good as he is. I don't accept that. It was rebellion. Let's not underestimate the importance of under of of grasping how evil rebellion is okay we need to be very very careful with that and our american mindset and i'm you know as i'm as i i bleed red white and blue okay um veteran and very proud of it our form of government of the people, by the people, and for the people is an appropriate one, but we need to be careful about how we talk about those who are in authority, even when what they're doing is wrong or unconstitutional or illegal or whatever. We need to be very careful about what we say. It's one thing to hold them accountable. It's another t- another thing to talk about them in a disdainful manner that crosses the line between us and God. Okay. Yes, Jim. There is a whole bunch of verses here. Where it says what? Oh, yes. There there are a number of verses. It isn't an isolated verse. Um, but I, w- I was thinking of one in particular, and I should have looked it up. It was about the time of King David. There are. There really are. Again and again, God ties. And we know what God thinks of witchcraft. It, it, you could go back to Leviticus and you could see that in the Levitical law. Um, you could see that in Exodus when God says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Um, and and it, it ties this concept of rebellion back to the evil of that and running all the way forward to Romans in case there are those out there who want to argue about, well, that's the Old Testament law. It doesn't apply anymore, which is not true. But uh, Romans 13, 1 Peter 5, I think it is, both tie the concept of Governmental authority has been put in place by God, and to resist the governmental authority is to resist God. Again, in our form of government, it's one thing to hold accountable. It's quite another thing to rebel and be disdainful of it. We need to be very careful about that. So, anyway... I'll get back off that bunny trail. The idea here, however, about rebellion is the point I wanted to make out. Um, This attitude that you're not in charge of me, well, I might be, depending on the situation. Okay, but it's, it's, nobody, nobody's my, nobody's in charge of me. Well, uh, 
how, we'll see how that works when you stand at the judgment. Okay? You are accountable. Every one of us is accountable ultimately to God. You, you may not like it. You may not accept it. But it's going to happen. Might as well get prepared for it. Yes. Yes. And that's certainly the, the point that was being made here is that, is that there's this, this ingrained attitude of rebellion that, that's held into this whole concept of despising authority. These people, these false teachers, by the way, the context is specifically about false teachers, okay? Daring, or the idea of being presumptuous, for them to presume upon God and think they're going to be able to teach some of this stuff and not be held accountable is very presumptuous. Self-willed. The two words put together in that context like that really carries the meaning of, of having delight in self. It's used of a person who is determined to please himself at all costs. And we see people like that even outside of being teachers, being uh, in the Christian circles. We, we see that in society a lot too. Yeah, well, if it makes me feel good, it's good. But we see it, and it's becoming more and more common where there is that lack of self-restraint. These kinds of people do not tremble when they revile, when they speak against angelic majesties. That word speak against or revile, it, it's, it's tied in with the root word for blaspheming. Okay? This angelic majesties, first of all, the word angelic is added in there. It's not in the text. And I don't agree with it. Because the word majesties is better translated as dignities. And it ties back to the concept of, of authority. Okay? The translators carried the word angelic f into it because of... Um, verse 11 where it says whereas in contrast by context angels who are greater in might and power do not bring reviling judgment against them before the Lord because of that verse the translators I, I believe mistakenly took the concept of and of, of majesties of, of, an, of angelic beings and applied it to the word majesties or dignities Oh, in, in modern English, we would call them dignitaries, but that does not carry the mindset of angelic, and I think that's a better word for it. So those who are in authority as dignitaries is, is, is kind of the, the setting here, okay? I'm going to re, redo that then. Daring or presumptuous... Um, determined to please himself at all costs. They do not tremble when they speak against or blaspheme dignitaries. In contrast, angels who are greater in might and power do not bring a reviling judgment against them before the Lord. Against them is talking about the ones who are doing the reviling. If you look at the antecedent in the, in the, in the, in the verse... That's always the context. So even when you've got these people who are speaking against dignities, this idea of rebellion, it, it ties right back into all of that. Even the angels who are greater in might and power don't dare revile them before the Lord. Don't dare say, look at these idiots over here. How easy is that for us to do that about, about people, though? Okay. I want to take a moment here, carry this concept forward just a little bit. I want to flip, have you flip over to Jude 
It is a single chapter. It's nestled between 3 John and the Revelation. And I want to look at just a couple of verses there. We get a similar snapshot of some of these of some of this context from Jude. And and because people don't correlate some they don't cross reference some verses in, in scripture, there are those people who will say, Well, okay, so you know, Paul said that, but Peter never did, or Peter said that, but we never hear that again, those kinds of things. This is Jude. This would be the half brother of Jesus. And it says, uh, let's start in verse 5. Um, and I'm going to read through verse 11 so that when we get back to Second Peter, we can tie it in a little bit more. Verse 5, now I desire to remind you, though you know all these things once for all, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. And angels who did not keep their own domain but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Doesn't that sound like what, what we were talking about earlier in, in chapter 2? Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they in the same way as those as these indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Yet in the same, day, same way these men, also by dreaming, defile the flesh, reject authority, and revile angelic majesties. I did not have time to break this one out to see where that word angelic came in. But Michael the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these men revile the things which they do not understand, and the things which they know by instinct, like unreasoning animals, by these things they are destroyed. Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, and for pay they have rushed headlong into the error of Balaam and perished in the rebellion of Korah. In verse 5, uh, destroyed those who did not, do not believe ties back to the story of Korah uh, when he rebelled against Moses. Um, let's jump back now to Second Peter. I don't want to. I don't want to bunny trail off into that too much. And I did not have time to break all of that out the way I would have liked to. I would have loved to have been able to to go word by word in that, especially some of the correlations. But I did not have that time. Um. Whereas in contrast, verse 11, though angels who are greater in might and power do not bring reviling judgment against them before the Lord, but, or in contrast, these, which is false teachers who live out the desires of the flesh and please themselves, like unreasoning animals born as creatures of instinct to be captured and killed. That's almost word for word, word what Jude said. Okay. By inspiration, God used two separate men to say the exact same thing about these kinds of people. Okay? Um, like unreasoning animals, born as creatures of instinct to be captured and killed. This literally translates out as literally bred as food animals to be slaughtered because of the position they have embraced. Unlike food source animals, this is applied to to um, to these men because they chose the direction they went. Okay, reviling or speaking down upon where they have no knowledge, they are literally ignorant about. 
Um, they will, in the destruction of those creatures, also be destroyed. Could easily be translated as, in their destroying, they will be destroyed. We're going to see that again uh, toward the end of this, of this chapter. I might even make it there, being as I've been moving right along. <laughs> Lucy, Lucy has faith that I'll be able to slow down here somewhere. <laughs> We do have a long way to go, but you're going to start seeing this tie together more and more, okay? Okay, these bad angels, did, did they get said to be the devil? They are not the devil. Lucifer is the devil. Yeah, well, did he get, was he a bad angel? Yes. Yeah. He, 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 okay, but those bad angels, yeah. Lucifer was a bad angel. He was the head bad angel. <laughs> okay, we... We and and we know him as as Satan now. He's he's no longer referred to as Lucifer, okay. Um, and we get other little snip, snippets in Scripture that when he rebelled, when he said, like like as is recorded in Isaiah, he says, "I will be like the Most High." You know, I, I've made the the humorous point that he had eye trouble. I will this, I am that, so on and so forth. Okay, And scripture does indicate that he was one of the most beautiful angels and he ministered directly. At, he is a cherubim, a cherub, excuse me, not plural. And, and he ministered directly with and to God Okay, on the holy mountain in heaven. He rebelled. And when he did... Uh, I believe it's in Revelation that we we see that that he's referred to as the dragon, and he drew a third of the stars of heaven with him, is the is the reference, and that is a, re, a referring to about a third of the angelic host of the time followed him, and that's what we know as demons now. Okay, now a portion of those, and we don't know we don't have any. We have just these two small glimpses that I'm aware of. What they did was so vile. And I have, by the way, I have my own suspicion about this, but I am not going to go into that right now. A portion of them did something so completely out of station and unacceptable to God that he not only cast them out of heaven... And we see no redemption opportunity for them ever again because they they saw God, okay. But a portion of them exceeded the ev evil of all of the others to the point that they have been specifically and specially judged, held in darkness until the final judgment. Okay. So these these angels are so vile, so bad that God restrained them completely okay. even satan himself still gets to walk about walk to and fro on the earth deceiving and all of all of the stuff we have okay so we have kind of two categories yeah there you go hell jail <laughs> Well, we see, but we do see reference to it here in Second Peter, and we see it again in Jude. Okay. I didn't, I didn't get that. But no, yeah. Okay. No, that's fine. A great question. Um. All right. So these false teachers, uh, like unreasoning animals, um. Because of the position they embraced, speak down upon where they have no knowledge, they're ignorant about, and they will in the destroying be destroyed. They will be, verse 13, suffering wrong as the wages of doing wrong. Without breaking this out too much, stop and think about the word wage. It's easy to glaze over some of these words, but what is a wage? Pardon? Payment. Payment. Pay, 
it's a salary. It's specifically payment for work done. It's something you earn. Uh, we see in Romans, the wages of sin is death, is separation from God. It's the same, it's used the same way here. At, they will receive as their wages the wages of, uh, uh, so the, uh, they will suffer wrong as a payment for doing wrong. They count it pleasure to revel in daytime, in the daytime. Uh, this, this, they count it pleasure. It's, this phrase is used in, in reference even very much in, um, in secular writings of the time. It's, all, it's always used, as a matter of fact. I could not find an example that, that violated this. It's always used in reference to sensual gratification. Um, we get the, the, the root of this word uh, translates into the English language, and we get the word hedonistic or hedonism from it. Okay? Uh, so we can see how that idea carries forward. Hedonism um, is, is this whole idea of, of everything for pleasure. Okay? Um, you got to do something in order to find out if it's pleasurable. It's, it's, we're just going to do it for pleasure. Okay? Very much focused on that. Um, they revel, revel. They, they live live delicately and comfortably in the daytime. This vileness with which they do these things sensually, they're willing to do it in the daytime when it's shameful enough, at best it should be done at night. Okay, now we can carry that into all kinds of, of nuances of, of the words, and we're not going to get into all that here because that isn't the point of this conversation and this, and this study, but... It says they are stains. They are literally disfiguring spots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions. Uh, that word des, des, de, <laughs> deceptions. That word deceptions is, is actually better translated as dissipation or sinful pleasures. So they are reveling. They are living delicately and comfortably in their sinful pleasures. As they carouse with you, having eyes full of adultery that never cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. Uh, the idea of enticing is this idea of trapping or ensnaring with bait. Unstable souls, those who do not have a solid, committed, biblically based conviction to work from. Okay. Um, I'll get back to that. Uh, having a heart trained or being disciplined and exercised in greed. Accursed children, or literally children of the curse, forsaking the right way. They have gone astray, having followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of righteousness. Again, that same example was used in, in Jude. Okay, It's amazing how much those dovetail in here. Um, I want to I wanna go back up to verse 13. I want to start tying a couple of words together here. It's, uh, for context's sake, uh, they count it pleasure. I mentioned that that is always used in, in even secular writings for sensual gratification. Um, Toward the end of verse 13, it's their stains reveling in their, in their sinful pleasures as they carouse with you, having eyes full of adultery that never cease from sin. We're getting a word picture here of these, of these false teachers. They are absolutely involved in their sensuality. Now, whether this is sexual or not is a question that could be applied. Um, that is certainly a piece of it. But there are a lot of things that are sensual that have nothing to do with sexual. And I want to differentiate that, even though in our society we tend to think of them as almost the same. 
they're not. Okay. Um, yet it is tied in with with the idea of sexuality, with with eyes full of adultery. Okay. Um, they are enticing, unstable souls. As I dug into this a little bit more, these unstable souls, these are the people who um, have been exposed to the gospel. They've been exposed to godliness. Could very well be, if I could dare to build a word picture in our in our group here, the people who are exposed to Christianity of this church through the members of it working with the food bank and and some of that entrance into it's not just oh they're Christians you know it's oh they're Christians and they're they're starting to get this interest in it and maybe you've had an opportunity to begin to present the gospel to them and they kind of understand it they have not made a decision to commit to Christianity yet. And when I say commit to Christianity, I'm not talking about the concept. I'm talking about accepting Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, being saved. Okay? They haven't gotten there yet. And because they haven't gotten there yet, but they're kind of on the path toward it, and they're being drawn into that discussion and have an interest in it, and they're open to it, they're unstable. They're, they're, uh, I, you know, they're, I enjoy my life in sin, but I get how, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's some draw here to being saved and, 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 and accepting Christianity as a way of my life instead. Okay. And they're right in that unstable decision making process. And these false teachers, Entice them back away from that. Okay, there's 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 kind of what what Peter's talking about here. He entices unstable souls, having a heart trained. He has whoever this false these false teachers, and I would say we can't even necessarily restrict it to men because in our society we have. Women who who are now teaching the Bible. Well, couldn't false teachers just be anybody who talks to somebody else? Yes. 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 Absolutely. Okay. This is not necessarily formal teaching. Show it by the way you live. You would be a false teacher. Live in the wrong place. The bad place. Yeah. Certainly, yeah, certainly a false witness or a bad witness, if, if not a teacher. And, and this is, but this is why carrying it more to the formal position, those who would teach in a church must be vetted, must be appropriate, and must be held accountable for what we teach. Okay, and, and, and that's why I regularly tell, tell you guys, Look at what I say. If I teach wrongly, if you can show me in Scripture where what I say is not right, please correct me. I have an accountability before God and man to make it right. I can't take back words if they're said in error. But if I don't correct it, I stand accountable before an eternal God. And I take that very seriously. Yes, Alice. How are you doing? Well, yeah, you know, it's all great, but you have to be circumcised. You have to do this. You have to do that. You know, what Paul's saying is incorrect. And they would lead them down a wrong path. You know, I've, I've wrestled with that one with this passage myself or something really similar to it. But I tend to lean away from that personally because of my understanding of some of the other contextual references 
that we haven't gotten to yet, but the, a little bit later in the chapter, there are some things that indicate that these, certainly the false teachers are not saved, but I don't think the people they're leading astray are necessarily saved either. And it brought to mind as I chewed on that one, uh, Jesus' accusations about the Sadducees and Pharisees and scribes of his day who not only don't believe, but prevent those who are on their way. And that's kind of the visual I get out of this. I don't think they're saved. That is certainly between them and God, ultimately. But I, I just, I don't think they, they, they have quite made that, made that point of things yet. Um, but as far as these teachers are concerned, Peter says that they have a heart that has been disciplined and exercised in greed. Okay? So now you have a snapshot of what their focus is. Again, tying it back to it's all about self. Uh and it says they are accursed children, literally children of the curse, which is why I don't believe the false teachers could, could ever be called saved. Oh, I wasn't about oh, no, no. I know you weren't talking about the, about the teachers, but just in case anybody got that misunderstanding, I believe Peter's just clearing that one in particular up. These false teachers have been allowed to be teachers and are clearly not saved. Okay. What's that? No. They're people. They're not devils. Okay. I'm sorry, what's that? Well, there's false teachers now, too, absolutely. But what this, is, this context was, was Peter talking to those in the dispersion, but he also refers back to all the way back Back into Old Testament times, there have always been false teachers, okay? But he's getting very, very explicit about some of the things about the false teachers that were going to rise up out of the, the Christians of the dispersion, and they haven't gotten any better now, okay? However, the, the root sinful impulses of humanity have not improved either, so... The causes are still there. Um, but they're still going to be, like, like those bad angels, they're still going to have a time when they can be beaten. Abs they could, well, the fallen angels can never re redeem themselves, can never be redeemed. The, the offer is never given to them. Now, any one of these people could reject what they're doing and turn to Christ and be saved. Certainly the grace of the cross is sufficient for that. But like those devils that were sent to hell, they're, they're, they weren't destroyed. They're sitting there waiting. For the judgment, but they are never offered redemption. So the false teachers would be the same, wouldn't they? No, because we're still talking about people here. Okay. And so until they die, okay. the offer... People and angels are very different. And this whole concept of, of people dying and becoming angels is, is quite frankly, I would dare to say blasphemy. But they are completely different beings. And, and demons are never, ever, ever offered redemption. People always are. The offer of the cross is open to every person who is ever born till they die. Until they die. And then there is nothing in Scripture after that. For Christians to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You make your decision on earth, and that does fix your eternity. No, there is no second chance after you die. They're, they're not having a second chance. They're... The, there is a point where they where scripture indicates that they will be released from the pit, but that is not for redemption. Okay, okay, I misunderstood that part. Yeah, no, that's fine. Let's fix it. Uh, 
can't. Nope. Okay. No such thing. Okay. okay. And the reasoning is clear and, and makes sense. Those angels, those demons were angels on the holy mountain of God. They right. stood before God. They right. knew God personally. That's why they don't have a second chance. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we're almost out of time. Let's let's kind of tie this up. Um, forsaking uh, these cursed children, forsaking literally haven't forsaken the right way, which means they understand the concept of salvation and they choose not to take it because they would rather live in their sensuality. Having forsaken the right way, they have gone astray, having followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wage, wages of righteousness. Sorry, what's that? I'm sorry, of unrighteousness. You are absolutely correct. Um, I am going to stop there because I don't have time. I want to, I want to uh, use verse 16 to go into Numbers 22, which is where we see the story of, of Balaam, but I do not have time to do that this morning. And I don't have to because I got several more weeks here. and we, we, we can chew this out. I don't have to tie this up for you. So we're going to stop there, and I'm going to actually probably jump back up to verse 12 just to pick up the context. But let's shut it down for today. Well, I got all the way through verse 14. Well, I kind I kind of talked about 15. Okay. But I'm going to I'm going to start next week with verse 12, although I don't need to to break it all out like I did this time. I can read through it and pick up the context and then go into verse 15 from there. Okay? It's good to be back. You guys are putting up with me again. <laughs> Well, I hope so. I really do. And, and some of these things are things that in, in, our, in our modern churches are simply not, they're not willing to teach it. And don't misunderstand either, though. What we're starting to delve into is some, is some advanced theology. There's a lot of concepts being brought in here as we chew through some of these, these books of the Bible that are, that are, <laughs> they're not beginner stuff, okay? All right, let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for an opportunity to open your word, to really work on it, to digest it, to share it with fellow believers, to, to have interaction and and discussion and, and understanding that there may very well be things that others pick up on that, that I don't, I am, I am, I try to be diligent, but I am so limited in my grasp of some things. And I'm grateful, Father, for the things I have learned, not only by studying, but also by sharing. Um. So I thank you for that opportunity in my life, and I thank you for an opportunity to, to share it here with these people, your dear children, your local body. I ask that you would bless this time as we go forward into the next service. 